Here we go, 4.1, maximum and minimum values. So these functions might represent something. Position, velocity, acceleration, at which point the derivative tells us different things depending on which thing we start with. Keep that in mind. If I gave you any old function, I guess the question today is how can we use the derivative to find a maximum value or a minimum value within that function? This should uh, harken back to pre-calculus when you're given some random curve and you're asked to find these things called global and local extrema. Does that ring a bell at all? Global, local, extrema, etc. No, not at all. Okay, well we're going to get into that today. So if the answer is no, that's fine. Let's look at this first curve, x squared. Uh, does it have a maximum value? x squared. Does it have a maximum value? No, right? If I suggest this height is the maximum value for x squared, well then I don't need to look very far. I can plug in a number a little bit further out than this x. Plug in x plus 1 and suddenly I've got this height. Oh, maybe that's my new maximum. I plug in an x a little further out, I get another bigger number. There's no maximum value on x squared. Is there a minimum value? Yes. And what is the minimum value? Zero. Good. So what you've just found is actually the global minimum. of x squared, it's zero. If I say global because there are, out of all of the minimums for this function, that is the smallest. It's also a local minimum because if I look close by, so I notice the global minimum happens at x equals zero. So if I look close by in my x's, I notice that this is also the minimum for all the nearby points. So it's both a global and a local minimum. It's not always the case that a local minimum is a global minimum. Uh, for example, Let's say this curve ends here. This here is the global min. There's no other point on this curve that goes lower than that. It's also local because if I look close by, it is the smallest thing nearby. Over here, I have another minimum, but it's different. And if I imagine a little ball rolling over this curve, it could get stuck in this trough. So that makes it a local minimum. Because if I picture just the nearby surroundings, it is the smallest thing nearby. Same for right here. But if I look at all the minimums that exist, that's not the smallest. So it's not the global. I could talk about this in terms of maxima too, which is why I drew this blue curve for negative x squared. It's, it's, it's kind of just the mirror picture of what we're dealing with here, both in definition for global max, global min, uh, right? They're reflections essentially of each other, um, and local and uh, local max and local min are also sort of same definitions just turn on their heads. Something's a global maximum if it is the tallest thing on the graph. It's just a local if it's the biggest thing nearby. So we've got a global max over here. And we've got local max here and here. If I cover up the rest of the curve, this is the biggest point in this little area. Similarly, that's the biggest point there. And out of all these biggest points, the 
the one on the far right is the biggest, the tallest of them. So my question that I should have asked at the beginning, instead of this stuff over here, I could have stopped there and asked this. What is the relationship graphically, really, between derivatives and extrema. Extrema are global max min, local max min, these things. So for any of the curves I've drawn, I suggest if you looked at their derivatives, there's a correspondence between something about the derivatives and the exact locations of those max and min. If you've seen calculus before, this, I suspect you remember this. This is like a big topic usually in calculus. If you've never taken calculus, this is your chance to answer. Do you see it? Think of derivative as slope. What do you notice about slopes and maxes and mins? We'll start with the simplest x squared. The slope here in sine is positive, negative, zero. Negative, still negative, still negative, still negative. Here, zero. Positive, 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 positive. The derivative changed the signs. It went from being negative to being positive. And exactly where it changed signs was where that minimum was. Go over here. You can forget about these endpoints for a minute. I'll explain how to figure those out later. But derivative is positive here, right? Positive, 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 zero, negative. It changed signs. There's an extreme of there. Negative, 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 zero. Positive, positive. There's an extreme of there. When the derivative changes signs, you have a an extrema. Okay. In other words, a zero of a derivative might be. I say might be because of weird situations like the one I'm about to draw. X cubed, you're familiar with this graph. Does it have any local min, local max, global min, global max? Does it have any of these things? I didn't draw this flat enough, so let me redraw it. It doesn't have any global minimum because this thing keeps going down. It doesn't have any global maximum because this thing just keeps going up. It doesn't have any local max or min. Well, let's see where the derivative is zero. Positive, 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 zero. Positive, positive, positive. Derivative goes from being positive to being zero to being positive. This might be an extreme value. We know it's not global because of this tail and that tail. Is it local? So we cover up everything else and we ask ourselves, nearby, is it the biggest thing around? Or is it the smallest thing around? Nope. So it's neither. But there is something that changes on this graph. The left-hand side is 
kind of half of a frown. The right hand side is half of a smile. We'll talk about that in a bit. Maybe a couple days. I can't even predict what I'm supposed to be doing today, so <laughs> I'm not even going to dare to guess. But this is a really key insight into what the derivative can tell us about maximum and minimum values of any function that's differentiable is that if we can find the zeros of a function's derivative, we can determine where it takes maximum and minimum values. This is really, really applicable in places like economics. You write some cost function, you write some revenue function, you want to maximize these things, you want to minimize these things, you take their derivatives. If you've modeled your business appropriately, you take their derivatives, you find the minimum for cost. You find the maximum for revenue. You strategize that for your business. The optimal strategy, right? This is huge. You can think about it also in industry, building things. You can think about it in terms of programming. Is there an optimal way to sort a list? You can think about it in terms of lots of things, but if you can write a function if you can write a function for a phenomenon, something that you see then the derivative gives you insights into optimal strategies or optimal situations. And by optimal, I'm meaning max situations in the case of revenue. Ooh, you want to maximize that. In the case of Cost, you want to minimize that. In terms of work hours, you want to minimize that. In terms of scheduling your classes for next semester, the university scheduling system for when classes need to be, they better be minimizing all the possible conflicts between all possible classes for all possible students. I suggest that they've written a big model for the thousands of classes that take place, and they're minimizing conflicts. I guarantee that's happened. You think about water flow for a city. Ooh, water flow. If that stops in a city, we've got days. Literally days before we all have to get out. Right? If there's no water. So, we want to maximize water flow to every single person. So the infrastructure for how to build the pipe system, we better be maximizing things in there. We better be minimizing certain things in there. So you model it, you take derivatives, you find the optimal situations, and then you attempt to construct it that way. Traffic flow. Oof. There's so many applications of this. So let's get into some of them. Uh, some of the, the theoretical ones instead, not the actual applications of them yet. So this all is sort of just conceptual. Let me give you the exact definitions. So we're going to suppose that C is a number in the domain of a function F. Okay, D sub F, domain of F. F at C is a, your book defines it as absolute maximum
if the value of f at c well, a is greater than or equal to absolute f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for any other x in the domain. So this is what I call the global maximum, just a different term. Uh, my preference would be to continue using global, but that's not what Stuart prefers. And we call it the absolute minimum. Value of our function, if f of c is less than or equal to f of x for all other x in our domain. So if you think about the pictures that I drew, the ideas that I just talked about, I've been talking about globals here, absolute. The next thing to think about is local. So we're still going to have c being a number in our domain. Okay, c f of c is a local maximum if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for x close to c. So like I've done before, if I say here's my x, where I suspect there is a maximum or a minimum, if I only look at the x's that are pretty close to c, so x is anywhere in that little interval around c, if my function at c is bigger than everything else around there, then we have a local max. That's not what we have there, right? We have a local minimum. If f of c is less than or equal to f of x for any x close to c. Same definition, flipped around. So this is different terminology than I said before. I apologize for that. Absolute gives me the wrong impression. It, it makes me think we're taking absolute values of things, but we're not. Uh, that's why I prefer this word global, because we're thinking of this whole picture of the function, the whole thing, the global picture. Zoom way out to see the whole earth. Look at the coarse structure of our function, not the absolute structure. But that's what they have in the book, so there we go. So now there's this, this theorem called the extreme value theorem. Which may or may not be extremely important. And that's not a, not a joke, that's for real. Uh, the extreme value theorem is necessary in the proof of something called the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's like if I had to give you a theorem for calculus, the one thing that I want you to know ever, like nothing else really matters, everything else is just minutia, that the one thing is the fundamental thing upon which most other things are predicated. You can't prove that without this. So this is a really simple idea. The extreme value theorem is well titled extreme values. I, I've called these things before what? Extrema. They're, they're just extreme values. The extreme value theorem says if you're given any function on some interval, it says that it takes an extreme value somewhere on that interval. Okay, that's a really simple idea. Where could it take its extreme value is the good question. 
this is an example, but this example has the extreme value at the endpoint, right? Which is part of the extreme value theorem. That sometimes your biggest value is at an endpoint of your interval. Sometimes the lowest value is at an endpoint on your interval. This is not something the derivative would catch. Right? The derivative would catch this point, which is an extreme value. It's a local maximum. The derivative would catch this point, which is a local minimum. It would not catch the endpoints. But I could have very well had a function that looked different on some interval a to b. I could have had this, this, that. In which case, the derivative would pick up on the max and the min, right? And both are located in the interval, not on the endpoints. So the extreme value term is going to encapsulate all of this together. Okay? Here's the exact wording. If f is continuous, do you remember what that means? Based on limits, do you remember what that means? If f is continuous on a closed interval, from, say, A to B. Closed means these brackets are like that. And that means we have A and we have B included in that interval. Then, our function attains or achieves an absolute maximum We saw that over here. We have a continuous function on a closed interval, a to b, and then a function attains an absolute maximum, f of d. Oh, your book says f of c for the max, excuse me. And an absolute minimum, f of d for C and D in the interval. And the pictures that I just drew describe what, the, what those values might look like. They can be at the endpoints, which is always something to remember. There's not things the derivative will pick up on. But notice this also doesn't even require that our functions are differentiable. It only requires that it's continuous little less strict. And again, what it says in pictures is, if I give you any interval a to b, and I draw the graph of my function on there, it has to be completely connected here. It does attain its absolute minimum value and its absolute maximum value at some values d for the min and c for the max. Here, d is the initial value a at the end point. Here, c is the end value b at our interval. And it doesn't matter how I draw my curve, as long as it's continuous. There are definitely numbers in this interval that give me global max and global min. That's the extreme value theorem. It's kind of just a, a theorem that says something about the existence of something. Uh, just as a, like a, a riddle, if I remove continuous, Why doesn't it work? I 
I suggest you could literally draw me a picture that violates the extreme value theorem. If you remove this word, continuous. Function on a closed interval A to B. The function of, attains an absolute max and an absolute minimum. Can you think of a picture? absolute minima. There is no absolute maxima. We'd like to think zero is where that occurs, and that's in our interval. But our function is unbounded, we say. It has no limit on how high up it goes. There's a vertical asymptote there. Perfect. There's an example where there's no maxima. Can you come up with an example that has no maxima or minima? Make it even worse. Horizontal line, that has both, and they're the same. If I draw a horizontal line from here to here, that's continuous. What's the biggest value? What's the height of this? What's the smallest value? It's the height of this. So the absolute value, the absolute, see that's the problem. Absolute maxima and absolute minima are the same number which is what you get for a constant function. Yeah. Something that has neither. A vertical line. A vertical line. Now that's, that's tricky because what's my closed interval? See, now you're changing multiple things, but that's very good. We need to require that it's defined on a closed interval. If we say that a closed interval can be a point <coughs> that's defined at a point, then we can do something crazy like he suggests and say, here's my closed interval, and at this point, here's my function. A vertical line. What's its max and what's its min? <coughs> there is none. So this function actually is continuous, not on a closed interval as we would suggest here. We call this a degenerate interval where the endpoints are the same. So that's, that's like something Stuart doesn't put in his book. And it really needs to be a non-degenerate interval. Take this and change one thing about it, and you've got it. Marty? Ooh, square root. Mm -hmm. No? Yeah? Oh, goodness. Yeah, we can do that. Ah, uh, that's, no, we can't do that. Oh, we have to pick, we have to pick a closed interval where it's... Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Tangent, oops, doesn't have that. It has a bunch of branches that look like this, right? The next one is right here next to it. Let's make our closed interval from here to here. So our function starts here and skyrockets up, and then it starts here and skyrockets down, and then let's define it at this middle point as just zero. It's not a continuous function, it's defined on the entire interval, and it doesn't have a max or a min. Absolute max or min. 
So, very good. So when you don't have continuous functions, the world gets turned on its head. More of a story. All right. And then, there's this really nice theorem, which was written by this guy I've actually mentioned before, I think. Come on. I've mentioned it before, right? Yeah, yeah. This is literally Fermat's theorem, one of his many. Which says that if f has a local extrema, uh, so they use that word, it's so much more succinct. Max or min, a local max or min, at C, okay, and if F prime at C exists, then that derivative's value is zero at C. This is what we talked about earlier, sort of at a conceptual level. The derivative needs to achieve a zero value if you want to have a local or global maximum. Unless, by the extreme value theorem, the extrema is at the end of the interval, in which case you don't care what the derivative value is. So here's, here's a comparison question between this theorem and that theorem. <coughs> Does f need to be continuous? It doesn't say it in the theorem. that the derivative exists, at least at that point, right? If a derivative exists at a point, does that mean that the function is continuous at that point? No. Is it continuous nearby? about how the derivative is found, right? Take secant lines approaching a single point. And the left-hand limit needs to agree with the right-hand limit for these secant lines. In order for the limit to exist, I suggest there's some relationship between differentiability and continuity. might be wise to think about that, but that's too much for today. Is this clear? This is, this is what we talked about before. If, if we've got a graph where the derivative ends up being zero, there's the possibility that we have an extreme value. This specifically says that we've got a local extreme value at some input, and I know the derivative there. I can tell you the slope there. This says literally the slope has to be zero. It can't be anything else. So in pictures, if I draw this huge graph and then I essentially forget everything far away from a specific local min or max, 
If you can tell me the derivative here, it has to be zero. That's what this is. Now this is our tool, right? This is exactly the tool, along with this, that helps us find all max and min values for any function. The process goes something like this. You get your input domain. You get your interval, A to B. First, check the endpoints. Do you start, like the water flow problem, do you start with a high derivative or a high value, or, or do you end with a high value? Because those could be your max or min values. If not, differentiate the function that you've got. And anywhere that's derivative, the derivative is zero, that could be certainly a local extreme, maybe a maximum, absolutely speaking, globally speaking. So these are our tools. So I'm going to give a bit of terminology here. Critical values are x values, which cause f prime of x equals 0. So if you take the derivative of a function, you set it equal to 0, and you find the solutions, you find the zeros, those values for x are called critical values. Critical values. Uh, your book says critical numbers. Okay, so critical values slash numbers. Okay. Or there's a little bit more to that. And this comes back to the removal of that word continuous. What if our function is not continuous? What if even this doesn't happen? Critical numbers are not just the places where our derivative is zero, because that implies this could happen. But what about all the places where we can't find a derivative? There's another very, very short corollary of all these things, which says if you have a local max or min at a value c, then c is a critical number. That's like this. It's a restatement of this, essentially. And then your book goes through something called the closed interval method, which I'm not going to take the time to write all down. We're just going to example it with the time that we have left. And I believe we've got plenty of time. So let's start with polynomial. And let's try and find every single local and global max and min on some closed interval. Okay, so that's our goal. x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1. This is our function. I don't care what it represents just now, it's just a function. I'm going to say find all critical values, period. Right now, I'm going to remove the interval requirement. So A, period. <laughs> B, on a closed interval. So we'll choose a closed interval. Uh, negative 1 half to 4, they say. So, part A. Critical values are defined at zero derivative locations. So we're going to have to find a derivative. Not too terribly difficult. 3x squared minus 6x plus nothing. So 
is our derivative. To find the critical values, we set it equal to zero and find. We also need to ask ourselves, is this not defined anywhere? This is easily defined everywhere. It's a polynomial, so the domain is all real numbers. So we don't have any critical values where the derivative doesn't exist, because the derivative exists everywhere. So we simply set this equal to zero and solve. So I'll continue here without erasing that. Set it equal to zero, which means we've got this 3x squared minus 6x equals zero. Usually this boils down to factoring. We're coming up with some knowledge of our function, like if it's a sine or trig function. values for this function, all of them are 0 and 2. Yes? How did you get the 2? Let me just verify that I've got this right. 3x squared minus 6x. Uh -huh. 0. Factor out of 3. 3 and 2. Right. So, sorry, that goes to 1 and this goes to 2. Factor out an x. So this x squared becomes x, and this x becomes a 1. It's equal to 0, so I've got a number times another number equaling 0, which means either this number is 0, which means x is 0, or this number is 0, which means that x is 2. Always good to do sanity checks, especially when I'm the person writing on the board. It wouldn't be negative. Oh, no, never mind. No, right. yeah, no, no. Yeah, you just answer that yourself. If x minus 2 is 0, what's x? Yep. Um, I kid you not, I spent an hour this morning asking myself, what is the cone of something? Only to draw pictures and do bunches of examples to find out a cone. Wait for it. Looks like this. Seriously, one hour of my life this morning. Okay, that's all the critical values. Great, huh? So now if I give you some interval, it's kind of it's kind of like, why, why do we care about the interval? Okay, if I give you this interval, are those all in here? Yeah, they are, right? So what does this change in terms of the picture that we've been talking about all day. The interval helps you find these absolute max and min. Does this function have an absolute max or min? It's an x cubed, which means it's roughly speaking like this. Right? It goes down forever. It goes up forever. It only ever stops going up or down when I impose a restriction and I cut it off somewhere here and cut it off somewhere here. So this interval is necessary for finding, quote, absolute max and min. The very fact that I found two critical values, though, it tells me something about the shape of this graph in between. It tells me that it comes up, goes back down, and then goes up again. This is zero's input value. This is two's input value. I guarantee if we check these values, we're going to find that the value at two is less than the value at zero. Plug in zero, what do we get? Plug in two, what do we get? Eight, nine, minus twelve. Our graph comes up from some value to a height of one. 
and then it goes down to a value of negative 3, and then it keeps going back up. We've pinpointed exactly where these ends are. If x represented some production rate or some production number, this would tell you, in order to maximize profits or something, exactly how many things you need to make. Or if you want to minimize something, exactly what the value you want to shoot for in your marketing strategy or whatever it is, in order to minimize that function. Okay? Let's work on another one. I suspect we have time. Plenty of time. this the good example problem, or the good practice problem. I suspect we can work on things like this. So if this is hard, that's okay. It's good practice. To find all critical values, first, we take derivatives, right? Then we set equal to zero and solve. of x minus 2 sine x. What's the derivative of a sum of things, or a difference of two things? It's the I said, this, I said this to my wife yesterday. I said, sometimes teaching class is like going to the dentist. Pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. Pulling teeth. Except you actually need to go to the dentist to have teeth pulled. Okay, so here we are. Come to the dentist. Get some teeth pulled. I assure you, it's painless. <laughs> okay, what's the derivative of a sum? It's the sum of... Derivatives. Okay, there's a sum. Doesn't look like it. What's the derivative of x minus this? It's the derivative of x minus the derivative of that. Okay, derivative of x is derivative of minus 2 sine x, or just 2 sine x is 2 cosine x. So you knew this, you just didn't want to keep pull. Come on. Like Novocaine nowadays, and all these wonderful things that make it pain free. If you bring the earbuds, you can't even hear the drills. <laughs> Laughing gas. It's an altogether pleasurable experience at the dentist nowadays, by the way. It is. Sometimes I wish there really were Jedi mind tricks. Anyway. Uh, here we go. To find critical values, we found the derivative. Now we set equal to zero. Solving. We get this step. Solving one more, we get cosine is one half. So the critical values are. Anywhere the cosine is one half. And because you're very well trained, you immediately start drawing a unit circle. You know cosine relates to the x coordinate. 
So you immediately draw the x-axis. You draw this value for that, one half. You go straight up, straight down. You draw your angles. You say, oh, this angle will work, and this angle will work. If this one's some angle, this one's obviously the negative of it because of the symmetry in the circle. And then you think to yourself, what angle does that look like? And because of your vast knowledge of the angles and their apparent looks, you say pi over 3, plus or minus. You say not just those, but pi over 3 plus pi, pi over 3 plus 2 pi, pi over 3 plus I, I said pi, didn't I? I meant two pi's. Pi over 3 plus 2 pi, pi over 3 plus 4 pi, pi over 3 plus 6 pi, likewise for this one, or subtracting around. So we can come up with an entire list. Pi over 3 plus or minus 2 pi n. And in order to capture this minus, I have another plus or minus there on pi over 3. And that's the list of all critical values this function, which means this thing either takes a local max or a min at some one of these values. And now you're wishing I had given you an interval, right? <laughs> so what if x is only in 0 to pi? What are the critical values in there? Well, suddenly this negative pi over 3 is knocked out. That's not in 0 to pi. So this one is the only one that exists in this interval. So we only found the one that we care about. And if I go around the circle another 2 pi, we're outside of 0 to pi. So only pi over 3 exists as a critical value. In this subdomain or domain interval. Is it a max or a min? And how would you find out? So first you would plug it in. You would say f of pi over 3 is either a max or a min. find out what it is. Sine of pi over 3 is, because you're well trained, you practiced, you immediately draw your unit circle, you immediately draw that angle, you immediately ask yourself what is the height of this, and you remember off the top of your head it's squared of 3 over 2. And so you get it's roughly pi over 3 minus 3 3. Not roughly, exactly. Is it a max or min? Here's what you do. You pick some number that's really close to that. And you see if it gets smaller or bigger. You can do that right now, right? F of pi over 4. Why not? You can tell me pi over 4 values. That's the sines and cosines. They're root 2 over 2. So this turns into pi over 4 minus root 2, is that number bigger or smaller than this one? If it's smaller, then that's the max. If it's bigger, that's the min. We'll learn more about second derivatives and how to determine if that thing's a max or a min based on something else later. But that's all we've got for today. Sorry for the uh, original.